Hello, welcome to another virtual program with Maine Historical Society. I'm Kathleen Newman. Today is September 23rd, 2021, and this is Recovering History and New England with the Atlantic Black Box. Over 1,700 documented transatlantic slaving voyages were made on vessels that were constructed and registered in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, um, or from other seaports. But New England's connection to the history of slavery, enslavement, and the Atlantic slave trade remains largely untold. And so recovering uh, this history is the mission of the Atlantic Black Box Project. And we have with us tonight um, Meadow Dibble and Kate McMahon. So let me tell you a little bit about them and then I'm gonna uh, turn this over to our speakers. Uh, Meadow is the founding director of Atlantic Black Box, uh, currently in her third year as a visiting scholar at Brown University's Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Uh, she has joined the team at the Permanent Commission on Racial, Indigenous, and Maine Tribal Populations, where she serves as a research and community engagement manager. Meadow received her doctorate from Brown's Department of French with a focus on post-colonial studies and taught Francophone uh, African literature at Colby from 2005 to 2008. Originally from Cape Cod, Meadow lived for six years on Senegal's Cape Verde Peninsula, where she published a cultural magazine and coordinated foreign study programs. In 2016, she experienced a brutal awakening to the reality of her hometown's deep investment in the global slave economy. And ever since, she's been researching complicity among Cape Cod sea captains while developing the Atlantic Black Box Project. Kate McMahon is a museum specialist at the National Museum of African American History and Culture and leads research efforts at the Center for the Study of Global Slavery. She received her bachelor's in art history and master's in American and New England studies from the University of Southern Maine and completed her PhD in history at Howard University in 2017. Her dissertation was the Transnational Dimensions of Africans and African Americans in Northern New England, 1776 to 1865. Her current research explores New England's connections to and complicity in the illegal slave trade and colonialism from 1809 to 1900. She's committed to exploring the living legacies of slavery and the slave trade in the present day and interpreting this history for a broad public audience through frequent public speaking engagements and scholarly production. Thank you so much, uh, Meadow and Kate, for being with us this evening. Thank you, Kathleen. And thanks to you and all of your colleagues there at the uh, Maine Historical Society. We're so pleased to be here. Um, I also want to acknowledge the really tremendous work of the curators who designed your Begin Again exhibition. Uh, we really feel that that initiative is deeply aligned with our work at Atlantic Black Box in recovering the histories that have for centuries been concealed, redacted, effaced, uh, and submerged in the New England region. Thank you for, for bringing up the exhibit. I should mention that this program is part of a series on um, exploring the different themes and stories and history in that exhibit. For anyone in the audience that hasn't had a chance to see the exhibit, visit mainhistory.org where you can learn more about how to see it in person or virtually. So over the course of the past year or so, we have all come into a much deeper awareness of this stark racial disparities and inequities that exist in our nation and in the state of Maine. We've also witnessed with horror displays of anti-Black racism that have culminated in murder in broad daylight. The past we have learned is not past at all. To understand what we are experiencing today, we at Atlantic Black Box believe, as do our colleagues at Maine Historical Society, that we need to rewind the tape. We need to go back to the start. 
we need to begin again. It was James Baldwin whose work inspired the title of the exhibition, Begin Again, who said, if you don't know what happened behind you, you've no idea what's happening around you. We say, if we are not proactively working to correct the historical record and to tell a more inclusive story, we are perpetuating historic harm. And when I say we, I don't mean historians, I actually mean all of us. I've been thinking quite a bit recently about how President Obama, uh, in driving home his um, inspirational message of hope, liked to remind us that the arc of the moral universe may be long, but it bends towards justice. This past summer, in the midst of everything, Washington Post columnist Jonathan Capehart took a wide angle snapshot of the country's fraught social and political landscape and countered Obama's quip by saying, that moral arc doesn't bend toward justice all by itself. Indeed, it doesn't. People have to apply tremendous pressure and in a sustained way through committed action. And that is precisely what we advocate uh, through our nonprofit organization here, based here in Portland that uh, seeks to have a regional reach. At Atlantic Black Box, we see history as a critical site of collective action. We're mobilizing a grassroots historical recovery movement powered by citizen historians and guided by a broad coalition of scholars, community leaders, educators, archivists, museum professionals, anti-racism activists, and artists. To start us off, I thought we could just consider a couple of questions, um, basic questions. Does anybody feel comfortable answering any of these? When did slavery begin in Maine? When did it end? How many people were enslaved in your town, in the state? What forms of work were people enslaved here forced to do? What was the experience of enslavement like here? Who were some of the enslaved and free people of color in my town? And how did my town vote in the 1860 election? Please, if you have answers to any of those questions, we'd love to, to invite you to throw them up in the chat. What I'm showing you right now uh, is a quote from the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, a document of which we are very proud. We consider that this essentially is um, at the foundation of our democratic society. Um, there shall never be any bond, slavery, villainage, or captivity amongst us, it states clearly. And of course, at this time, Maine was a part of Massachusetts. However, it was in the same document uh, produced in 1641 that Massachusetts became the first colony to legalize slavery when it said, unless there will be no slavery unless it be lawful captives taken in just wars and such strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us. Do you see <clears throat> what I did there? This is the way in which we have been telling our history. We have taken the portions, true though they may be, uh, the, the portions that are pleasant um, and the ones of which we can be proud. And we've been leaving off the, uh, the ones that indicate we have deep, deep complicity in slavery and the slave trade. I wanna invite you to look at this wonderful map produced by scholar Lincoln Mullen. Um, it's actually an animated map that you can find online and it shows the spread of US slavery. Uh, and it's a very moving graphic. I'll have you know, this is the very first thing that you see because um, 
Professor Mullen has, he, he, he created this graphic um, with the very first census records available, which were from the 1790 census. But of course, by that time, Massachusetts, of which Maine was a part, had effectively um, abolished slavery. So Maine and Massachusetts and Vermont come off looking very good in this picture. But this picture is not at all representative of the reality. Someone looking at this would think, oh, well, there was no slavery in Maine or Massachusetts. Um, and we can feel very good about that. The reality is that here in New England, we have a very specific problem. We do not have Confederate statues to remind us of our racist past. And that's actually a handicap on our journey of historical recovery because the invisibility of our complicity has meant that we have been operating for centuries on a false notion of, as James Baldwin would say, what happened behind us. We have been passing down stories that are not based in fact, but rather in fantasies about bracing adventures on the high seas and about righteous communities founded on democratic principles, about hardworking upright citizens who earned every penny they acquired. And yet we have somehow been ignoring a staggering pile of evidence that would contradict these stories and fly in the face of our region's dominant narrative in which a staunchly abolitionist North serves as the heroic foil to the slaveholding racist backward South. To be sure, ignorance about the history of the place we now know as the United States is epidemic. But ironically, it's here in the Northeast, right here where people take tremendous pride in our history and are deeply invested in preserving and promoting our maritime heritage. It's here that we are arguably the most deluded about what happened on this land and about who lived in these communities, who labored here, and about the profits from uh, exactly what sorts of commerce went into constructing the beautiful built environment that we take such care to preserve. We are under deep illusions about where all those merchant seamen were sailing to and how this region fit into the global economy during what we nostalgically refer to as the golden age of sail. Simply put, New England is deeply alienated from its history. And I realize that this is a bold statement, but historians such as my friend and colleague, Kate McMahon, who will speak to you shortly, um, and, and many others in this emerging field of scholarship know enough to state with certainty that we have not been researching or discussing the most important thing there is in fact to know about New England and that is its extensive and longstanding investment in what we refer to as the Atlantic world slave economy or the global economy of enslavement. And by this, we mean participation by Northern shipbuilders, seamen, merchants, and bankers in the transatlantic and domestic slave trades, the enslavement of indigenous and African descended peoples throughout the Northeast. And we also mean the exploitation of enslaved labor through what was euphemistically referred to as the coastwise or provisioning trade in connection with the brutal sugar and coffee plantations of the West Indies and South America, where captives having survived the middle passage from Africa had only a seven year life expectancy. So brutal was the work. It is not by accident that our dominant regional narrative is so skewed and partial, so full of omissions and erasures. It is by design. We would like to invite you to participate in our project of historical recovery. And I'll talk more later about how you might do that. But historical recovery, I insist, is about 
recovering the truth. It's about making the invisible visible. And it's about working collectively to correct the story of New England. I'm gonna turn it over to my friend and colleague, Kate McMahon. Thanks, Meadow. Okay. Well, um, first, I would really like to thank the Maine Historical Society for inviting me to be here tonight um, and uh, Meadow for that really great uh, introduction and teeing things up. Um, tonight, I'm going to just do sort of a, a brief dive into Maine's connection to this uh, Atlantic world economy. Um, and the Atlantic world economy, I'll, I'll get into this as we go further, that Meta was discussing encompasses so much more than, uh, than just um, what, ha what was carried aboard those ships. Um, it includes the places and the people and the, the engines that were driving this commerce that led us to essentially the capitalistic economy that we know today. Uh, and slavery was the first truly global uh, trade network that existed in the world. By the 17th century, early 17th century, there was a network of, uh, of, of different nations that were trading enslaved people all over the world. Uh, and for example, Great Britain traded enslaved people on behalf of Spain uh, beginning in the mid 17th century. Uh, and so there was just a, a lot it was fully encompassing the entire world. And those, uh, this trade, this global trade had an immense human toll. The average mortality rate is some somewhere around 15% aboard, just aboard the vessels themselves. That does not account for how many people may have died in Africa in the intra-African slave trade or in the conflicts and wars that were often driving uh, the, the capture of enslaved Africans. Um, so this really causes, of course, long-term destabilization and leads to the colonization of Africa uh, in the later 19th century and eventually to the conflicts and crises that we see today in many parts of Africa. Um, so this had an immense human toll and we live with its afterlives all around us all the time. Um, in, in Maine and the rest of Northern New England, we tend to not really um, see how, how deeply uh, permeated our region is. Uh, we Just like Meadow was saying, we do not have Confederate monu monuments, we do not have plantation houses. Um, but hopefully by the time I'm, I'm finished this evening, you'll understand how, how Meadow and I and other people that are involved in Atlantic Black Box and, and people throughout the region, in, including uh, the region's African-American community who have long been championing this history, see that slavery and, um, and other forms of forced labor are all around us all the time. Um, so just for some quick numbers, about 12.5 million people uh, were, were um, transported during the period of the uh, transatlantic slave trade. Um, about 5 million of those people went to Portugal, uh, Portuguese Brazil alone, uh, which is a huge, of course, a number of people uh, when you look at in comparison to the United States, which only had about 300,000 people uh, that were transported to our shores. However, we had a naturally growing population, meaning that the, the population increased with births, that the mortality rate was um, sufficient enough, um, sufficiently low enough so that the population could grow that way. So this has, a, of course, a massive effect and, and Maine if, is not at all, separate from this history. Um, and I'm going to just briefly talk about Maine's 
um, involvement in the legal slave trade. Uh, and just, just briefly, uh, and the legal slave trade is basically the period up until 1808. And in 1808, the United States abolished its participation in the global slave trade uh, following Great Britain who had done it in 1807. Um, and, you know, first, just a few problems um, that we encounter as, as, you know, historians, but also as individuals who just want to learn about this history. And the first big problem is that there's a lack of research. There are few scholarly works that have undertaken this subject. Um, uh, for the region broadly, let alone Maine itself. Um, new work is currently happening by myself and, and many others involved in Atlantic Black Box um, to change that. There's also a misunderstanding of what the slave trade was. Uh, all, most people, I would say the public perception is that um, there were specific slave ships, that there were ships built specifically for the purpose of transporting enslaved people. And while that is true, there are a handful we know of of purpose-built slave ships. The vast majority of slave ships, particularly during this period after 1808, were regular merchant vessels that transported enslaved people along with a mixture of a lot of other cargo like sugar or lumber or salted fish or uh, you know, any number of manufactured goods like cotton cloth, those sorts of things. Um, so, so this is uh, uh, an area in which we really need to do more research and begin to look at the merchant economy of the age of sale in, in northern New England to better understand how to um, read these materials via understanding that this history is part of it. Um, and of course, there's there's also just in general, the reason why there tends to be a lack of research is that there are not um, significant uh, places for young scholars to study at um, high institutions of higher education in northern New England. Uh, and in Maine in particular, there's, there's really uh, not a, a anyone who specializes in this kind of history at, at any of the institutions, um, colleges or universities. So really there needs to be more opportunities and, and changes in, in departments uh, around this. But in, for the legal trading of enslaved people, we have scant evidence. And I saw a question in the Q&A earlier about um, the, the Black Point. Um, and frankly, I, I don't know of any evidence related to that. Um, it's a period in which we have very little evidence for the direct um, trade period. Uh, so there's not a lot of, uh, you know, it was, it was prior to when things like manifests were standardized, insurance hadn't fully been invented yet in a lot of cases. So if the vessel wasn't going through a trading company, a larger trading company, there may not be evidence for that earlier period. Um, and of course, there's just so many things that happen to merchant logs and, and those sorts of things. I'm not sure. Um, I would have to really dig deep. But here are a couple that we know of. Um, in particular, uh, we have evidence for this for this 1752 journey um, of the Betsy, which landed in Kittery. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they don't say how many enslaved people are on board, um, but we, we do know that people were landed in the state of Maine during the period of enslavement directly from Africa. There was also a regional uh, trade in enslaved people that happened within, uh, you know, inter, inter Commonwealth trading and that kind of thing, as well as uh, we have direct evidence, uh, for example, from William Pepperell that uh, enslaved people were being purchased in the Caribbean or taken from plantations that these folks owned in the Caribbean and transported to places like Maine. So um, we basically have a, a really small snapshot and that is partially due to evidence available to us and partially due to people haven't really had been able to dig deeply into the subject matter. We also know of a handful of vessels that prior to um, 1808, the, uh, that transported enslaved people to elsewhere in the United States. 
Um, so we, and we know that there was a colonial market for enslaved people in York, in the town of York by 1650 at least. Um, but essentially, uh, you know, this is the, the the stage that is set until about the the late 1780s. So after you know we become a country, um, there begins in New England to be legislation to bar New England citizens from participating in the slave trade. So um, prior to the American Revolution, Massachusetts citizens had tried twice to actually stop the trade and enslaved Africans, but were uh, they were not these these measures were not favored by the colonial governor, and they went nowhere. So um, Rhode Island and Connecticut did pass resolutions uh, barring import uh, the importation of enslaved Africans into their borders, but none of the colonial powers made any attempts at limiting the engagement of their citizens uh, uh, in the traffic in enslaved Africans elsewhere. So trading people, selling people outside of the colony, particularly to the Caribbean. Um, so it was not until 1787 that Rhode Island passed the first law in New England barring uh, their citizens from participating in slave trading outside of the colony uh, or outside of the state. <clears throat> um, and uh, they, fought, they levied a fine of 1,000 pounds, which was pretty significant for fitting out that vessel and an additional 100 pounds per captive that was on board the ship. Um, so Massachusetts and Connecticut followed with similar legislation in 1788. Um, however, as scholar Elizabeth Donnan, who uh, did a lot of the early work, uh, essentially combing these early archives to find evidence of uh, various states participating in slavery and their connections to slavery and the slave trade, she noted that, in quote, the legislative situation was confused by questions of jurisdiction con and constitutionality, all of which tended to aid the slave trader and to increase the zeal of abolitionists for federal rather than state action. Um, so, so essentially, uh, it, we are nearing uh, a point where the the country essentially is going to the government is going to need to uh, bar slavery, bar the participation um, of of Americans in the slave trade, and that's what they do in 1808. But prior to that, um, there's this really interesting case that is in the Maine Historical Society uh, in the Robeson Collection. Um, which is a uh, metal, we'll probably touch on that a little bit at the end, but it's a really large collection of materials related to the Robeson family who traded rum and um, were, were merchants in the city of Portland. Um, so in 1791, um, Thomas Hodges purchased enslaved people in Africa with the intention of selling them along with other cargo from Maine, so lumber and other things, uh, in the Kai Haiti. Hodges and the vessel's captain, Henry Skinner, decided to stop in Havana to sell the enslaved people uh, as the port had recently been opened up to trade. Uh, however, Skinner and Hodges knew they could make more money selling these enslaved people in the French colonies because of American restrictions, because of restrictions on American trade at that time, they were not supposed to be selling enslaved people in these French colonies. So uh, a lot of this, of course, has to do with treaties that were happening after the American Revolution and various changes in maritime law and trade law uh, that were changing rapidly in the Caribbean. Um, to bypass this, Hodges, uh, at the behest of Thomas Robeson, transferred 29 enslaved people into a French vessel, La Verime, and sold the enslaved people uh, there in, in uh, Haiti for a large pot large profit. Uh, this document on the left records the prices paid by each purchaser for the 29 people that were sold there. So on their discovery of this back in Maine, Hodges and Skinner were taken to court in 1792 because they had broken that 1787 law and were subsequently found guilty and fined just $200 for fitting out the ship and 50 pounds for each enslaved person sold, having violated that 1788 act and mass that um, barred participation in the foreign slave trade. So 
you know, they didn't suffer the full consequences, the full penalties that they they could have, but it was still a significant moment. And it shows that the, um, you know, the, the participation of Maine merchants and Maine ship captains in the slave trade began very early. Uh, and you know, certainly we know that it was present by the, the early earlier part of the 18th century, by the 1750s, but uh, more than likely uh, had been a long hit tradition prior to that of participating in this activity. So just briefly, uh, I'll, I'll touch on the illegal slave trade. After 1808, um, American vessels, essentially Americans were no longer allowed to participate in the slave trade. Um, however, some uh, ships did, a handful of ships landed illegally in the United States and actually brought enslaved Africans directly to the United States. The most famous is the Clotilda of 1862, which incidentally was built by two men from Maine who lived in Mobile. Um, however, they were few in number in comparison to the, the just vast amount of engagement that Mainers and people from across Northern New England had in the illegal slave trade to Brazil and Cuba. Um, and, uh, you know, there's there's a number of reasons for this, but essentially it, it, what's driving this is sugar. Sugar is, you know, the, the number one commodity uh, by the middle part of the 19th century. It is booming uh, in the global economy in terms of uh, every year exponential growth. And there is there are deep ties to, to Maine uh, and Cuba directly because of sugar manufacturing. Uh, if you look at, for example, J.B. Brown, um, they, they were one of the largest sugar refineries in the world at that time. Uh, and this, I think the second largest in the, in the United States. So in 1808, they passed this law, but basically uh, there's this period of total lawlessness and an increase in the participation of Americans in the slave trade. Uh, and they subsequently pass uh, two more laws in 18 and 18, 18 and 1819. And finally, uh, in the act of 1820, they make uh, participating in the African slave trade um, an act of piracy. So you could be hung for participating in the trade. So Essentially, Maine has, you know, these multifaceted connections to, to slavery and the slave trade. Um, and one way is via the domestic slave trade in the United States. And I'll just briefly touch on this before I talk about the, the broader foreign slave trade. Um, it, it is uh, perhaps some of these are some of the starkest examples I have of direct evidence of individuals being caught up in this this horrific trade. Uh, these are two slave ship manifests uh, from New Orleans um, that show inbound from from Maine, the brig Susan Soul and the brig Venus, who were both owned by Rufus Soul of Freeport, um, having transported enslaved people, 15-year-old Mary aboard the Venus. And on the right, um, there is uh, Caroline and her two children, six and one year old, that were transported um, on behalf of a slave trader from Charleston to New Orleans for sale. Um, and this is just, you know, two of, of quite a few examples that I have of, uh, of main ships bringing enslaved people along, a small number of enslaved people along on their regular cotton packet routes. Um, and I think with additional research, we'll find a lot more of this. But we have some preservation problems in New England. Um, of course, we, we know that many of the shapes, uh, the manifests, uh, maritime records were destroyed in the Custom House fire and in various fires across the city of Portland over the centuries. Um, and the same thing is true for Boston. They were destroyed in a fire, others have been destroyed in floods. So we really only have a small amount of these manifests uh, that exist for uh, northern cities. The vast majority that we have are the entry manifests for cities like New Orleans, um, as well as Savannah and a few other places in the um, southeastern United States. So um, this is going to hopefully shift in the next few years as more records get digitized and we'll have a better understanding of it. Um, but this is just one case. Um, and I, if you're interested in learning more about this case, I gave a, a longer talk for me in Historical Society last year, 
on this topic, uh, which is up on their website. But um, you know, it, it starts with a ship captain from from Vassalboro named Ebenezer Farwell. Farwell came from a very uh, you know, notable family. His father's house, which you see in the bottom right hand corner, is on the National Register um, of Historic Places. His father was considered, you know, one of the founding fathers of Vassalboro. And so he he comes from a, a decent, decent family with decent stature um, and becomes a ship captain. And um, he begins uh, as the captain of the ship Transit, which was built in 1829 in Bath um, and was a 121, uh, 199 ton uh, vessel. Um, and in 1838, uh, Farwell became the captain of it. Um, and it goes, the vessel goes to Liberia and the Ivory Coast and returns to the port of New York City with three enslaved Africans on board. A fourth man named Yazi um, was left at his father's house in Vassalboro on the return journey from uh, Liberia to work as an indentured servant. Um, and this was, uh, you know, obviously a, a huge, huge break in federal law. Essentially what uh, happens is, is, is when they enter the port of New York City, um, a group of African Americans that dock workers that lived near the dock actually alerted the federal authorities, the marshal, and uh, they, they led by David Ruggles. Um, so he was uh, essentially arrested in New York and charged with having broken this 1818 law. Um, after he was arrested, uh, you know, he, he gets put on trial and essentially uh, is acquitted. Um, it, the, the judge's uh, order said basically, uh, in order to disprove the allegation that he intended to sell these men, this is a quote, as slaves, Captain Farwell produced two papers, one of which was an agreement he made with three of these Africans, and the other, a separate agreement with Yazi to pay them and him so much per month for their services in assisting to navigate his ship from Africa to New York. An attempt was made to discredit these statements and Mr. Ruggles and other, another colored man named Slauson deposed that they were acquainted with the handwriting of a man named Hughes, now in Africa, whose name is subscribed as a witness to the agreement made with the Africans and that they did not believe it to be his handwriting. Judge Betts decided that the law prohibiting the bringing of native Africans to the US did not prohibit it bringing a free men here to do involuntary labor. The court discharged the complaint on the ground that the labor must be involuntary or what is tantamount to slavery, or it does not come within the provision of law. And so essentially Farwell is completely acquitted of this and they say, no, he wasn't slave trading. He was just forcibly transporting indentured servants, which doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, so Farwell returns to Vassalboro and decides to build this huge Greek revival house. And if anyone is familiar with Vassalboro, you may have seen this house before. It sticks out. It certainly doesn't uh, fit in with its surroundings. It is directly adjacent to his father's small little brown cape house that's uh, right next door. So he builds this big house and he runs out of money. Uh, so in 1841, he decides to become the captain of the schooner uh, out of Plymouth named Mary Carver. Um, and he heads back to Liberia. Um, so they arrive in Liberia and there is some sort of dispute and there's a, a, a split between what the Africans say happened and what the uh, US Navy essentially says happens after this point. But essentially they arrive in Liberia, there is a dispute, I'm sorry for my dogs if you hear them, um, there is a dispute over uh, the 
a trade interaction aboard the Mary Carver and the Africans attack and kill everyone on board. Um, and, you know, there's this newspaper article on the left and then another fantastic document here in the center. Um, a lot of this information comes uh, directly from this document that is in the main historical society in the Spalding collection. It's a essentially Dr. Spalding was um, he he wrote these notes up based on the journal of a, an officer on board who likely actually is in this image right here uh, because this was the very first activity of the sloop of war Saratoga which was built at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard um, and this vessel essentially after um, after uh, Farwell's death a year later in 1842, its first activity is to go to Liberia and uh, and and commit essentially um, uh, retribution. They call it a retribution and they sail down the coast of Africa and proceed to raise, burn down and uh, kill dozens of people. Uh, and uh, dozens of villages. So hundreds of people were impacted by this. Their villages were burned. And it turned out that the, the people who had been accused of murdering um, Farwell had actually already left the area. So they just went down and made an example of all of these villages and communities along the border between Ivory Coast and Liberia. Uh, and, and really what becomes clear by reading this document and reading some of the other naval accounts uh, that were left behind is that this was very much a, uh, a, a moment of retribution for the the country and that the idea that these American captains could be murdered, even though what is more than likely uh, and what has become clear through additional research is that Farwell was there to trade enslaved people, to purchase enslaved people, and something happened. He set up what was called a factory uh, in Liberia, which basically means he set up a trading post for himself to return to. So he knew he was coming back. This was not something where he uh, that where he was, you know, caught up in some accidental trade uh, dispute. This was really um, what what the African. Uh, testimony states is that they murdered, the crew murdered a member of the, the um, party of the, the local king. Uh, and that was the reason why the crew uh, and the vessel were killed and the vessel was sunk. So essentially Farwell, uh, Farwell dies and his death becomes a, an impetus for the United States government to force colonization on this group of people who were resisting colonization in, uh, uh, at the border of Ivory Coast and Liberia. So after this incident, um, you know, we really begin to see an uptick in the number of vessels participating in the slave trade to Cuba. So in the 1830s and the 1840s, the vast majority of these vessels would have landed in Brazil. Um, we do, I don't know where the Mary Carver landed prior to uh, coming to New York, but clearly they had uh, landed somewhere else. This is pretty commonplace. Um, but what I have begun to discover through my research is uh, somewhere in the area of 80 vessels from the state of Maine <clears throat> that were uh, transporting enslaved people. Either they were built in the state of Maine or they were registered in the state of Maine um, that were transporting enslaved people to Cuba in the 1850s and early 1860s. And what I have uh, been able to, the, the the numbers I've been able to put to this are approximately 20,866 people were transported by main vessels out of Cuba just in this eight year period. Um, and uh, what I don't know, you can see in the far right column, I know it's very small, is uh, really the numbers of people that were transported on approximately half of these vessels. So for half of these vessels, I have no additional information other than that they successfully made a journey. Um, and really what this accounts to is a, a true building block of the New England economy. Um, we have 
uh, I have some numbers here um, based on a previous figure of 18,000 people. I have since added uh, additional, additional figures, but essentially in Cuba in 1855, um, an enslaved person sold for approximately $400, which was about $12,000 per person in today's currency. Um, so the average profits uh, that I have currently for known journeys is, is 7.2 million um, or $151 million in today's money. Um, and the average net sale per journey was about $275,000 or $8.3 million per journey. The cost of the outfit per the New York Times in 1857 was $174,000. So the net profits for the owners is $100,000 or $3.1 million per journey that the owners get. So that money is all of this is flowing back into the state of Maine. This is just the state of Maine. This does not include other New England states. Maine and New England vessels make up the vast majority of American vessels that were trading in enslaved people in Cuba during this time period. Um, and you know the estimated value of this slave fleet was $11 million or $332 million per year that was flowing back into Northern New England uh, uh, banks. And so we see here on the, on the left-hand side, I've done some quick calculations based on the value of Maine's timber industry that I found in a source that stated that it was worth $2.5 million in 1852. That means that Maine's slave ship fleet was nearly four times more value valuable than its timber industry in the 1850s. And that's just the figures that we know about. This is the tip of the iceberg. The vast majority of these vessels are vessels that got caught. That is how I find them for the most part. These, these people got caught. Uh, they either got caught by the British, they got caught by the Americans, or um, there is uh, some other kind of evidence where they got caught, they might've shipwrecked, they might, something might've happened aboard the vessel. So there's a whole iceberg that will never be known of people who successfully did this without ever getting caught uh, and without ever leaving any kind of evidence to this activity. It's just it's the same, we need to think about it the, the same way that we think about other illicit activities today. Um, so, you know, this really becomes deeply important for us to understand our history and for us to understand the complicity of northern New England and Maine in the global economies of enslavement and how that impacted us going forward. These were some of our most notable citizens. I'm not going to go into to Rufus Soul right now because I don't have a lot of time, but he was, of course, uh, you know, a very notable citizen of the town of Freeport, and yet he was engaged and deeply embedded in this business. So, um, you know, we have men like Frederick Drinkwater, who was a ship captain from the city of Portland, who uh, transported thousands of people, was responsible for the transportation of thousands of people on his own. There's 15 different vessels that he captained during this time period, just in the 1850s alone, uh, that he was the registered owner or the registered captain of. So we have a, a deep, deep history of this uh, in Northern New England and, um, you know, projects like Atlantic Black Box, this is far too much for me to do on my own. I can't possibly look into every single town and every single uh, place. Uh, so this is really, um, you know, part of the mission of the Atlantic Black Box is to get people to look in their own backyards and to ask these questions um, like what are in, I assume in the chat, I see a lot of notifications. So I'm going to end my slideshow, turn it back over to Meadow, who wants to wrap things up, and um, I will start looking at the chat and stuff. Okay. Um, thanks, Kate. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm, I'm really going to be brief because what we want to do is have a conversation with you. Um, I think <clears throat> what I wanted to emphasize uh, is sort of what Kate just said there. There's no possible way that a couple of us or a handful of scholars um, can actually process the amount of documents 
um, that are here in our archives uh, throughout New England um, in, a, in a pretty fragmented way, I would add. We really, <clears throat> we need everybody's participation to identify the sources in those small library collections, in the historic societies in your towns throughout Maine, um, and in your attics and your closets, you know, in those um, family collections that have been passed down. Um, there is critical information there. And what we're encouraging everyone to do is to <clears throat> share their findings. So I just, just briefly, you know, people um, want to know how to get started. And I would just say, uh, it's really simple. You get curious, right? Ask the most basic questions. What is my town's complicity? with slavery and the slave trade. And you can take that question to your local library, to the historical society. I'm not saying they're going to have, you know, ready-made answers for you, um, but it starts a process, a really important process. Often what we find in these historical societies and libraries, even, you know, um, the, the, at the pinnacle of, you know, those that contain <clears throat> the treasure trove of documents related to New England's maritime history, like the Phillips Library. Um, uh, you know, <clears throat> we haven't been cataloging, uh, we haven't been cataloging documents and collections in a way uh, that actually takes into account um, this, these elements of racial history. So it's very difficult. Uh, you can, you know, you can't just go in and say, please um, look up in your database everything that you have on my town's connection to the West Indies or my town's connection to Africa. Um, but that is a process with the help of um, great colleagues like those at the Maine Historical Society, at the Maine State Archive, et cetera, and throughout the region, um, there is work being done to you know, um, catalog things to make it easier to find these documents. But like I said, start local. What happened in my town? What happened in my family? You know, um, and if you're not a genealogy um, whiz, there are people who can help you at your local library. Um, also people connected with Atlantic Black Box who can help you trace your own uh, family history as I've been doing. What, what about my house? Could my house have some connection to this history? Um, <clears throat> we're all very proud of these lovely sea captains homes that we've done such a great job preserving for example and you know or the beautiful brick buildings in portland what's hiding behind the facade what's there at the foundation what money uh from whose labor participated in building these edifices we cannot it's a it's to my mind a matter it's a moral imperative to know these things, to ask these questions and to persist in asking them until we have answers. Um, because to avert our gaze and to say, I'd rather not know that dark history, it's unpleasant, that is perpetuating harm. Um, so get curious again, what about your church? What's, what's the, the local church's connection to this history? of enslavement. And of course, um, in what ways was the economy here, where, wherever you are connected? Because the reality is wherever you are, you know, if you're in New England, whether it's a coastal town or you're in inland, far inland, your local economy was connected to the broader global slave economy. It's just a matter of understanding how. Um, the second thing I would say, you know, is now that you've got your questions and you've begun asking people around town, 
find people that you can connect up with. We have seen wonderful examples of this. Um, and I'm going to hold up in particular our friends down in the Kennebunks who have created a wonderful citizen historian group um, with people, you know, from the local museum, people from the local church, racial justice activists, educators, uh, former teachers who are working together to uncover the uh, history of the Kennebunks through the lens of race. So um, who were the people who lived in this community whose stories have been forgotten or marginalized? Um, and what can we do to bring them back to the light and front and center? Um, so connecting with others is key because none of us can do this on our own. And we all have different areas of expertise. And I will say critically, you know, we need to hold one another accountable for doing this work. It's everything is easier when we have sort of accountability systems in the form of, you know, friends and colleagues who are like, hey, how are you doing with that project, that thing you said you were gonna, um, you know, uh, study. Um, <clears throat> but also we need to sort of be double checking one another's work because um, in, in an example that I like to give, um, it, it happened uh, to me early, very early on in my own journey uh, of historical recovery. I thought I had in my hands the very first um, smoking gun that would prove that Cape Cod sea captains were involved in the slave trade. It was a document from 17, uh, 74, I believe. And, um, and the transcript that came with the, you know, the actual original document um, stated this was a, a transaction involving a slave. Well, it, three days later, it occurred to me that maybe the word wasn't actually slave, but it was in fact stave because slave was actually not a term frequently used at that time. Uh, more, more common would have been to refer to enslaved people as Negro, Negro man, Negro woman, et cetera. And uh, on the other hand, we were doing a tremendous amount of trade in staves, but that doesn't mean this transaction had nothing to do with the global slave economy. It had everything to do with it because these pieces of wood that are formed into barrels are made from wood that was um, cut here in Maine, cut here in, in, in Massachusetts, and that was shipped down to the West Indies to hold the molasses and the sugar uh, that was then transported back here. So anyway, I'm gonna stop talking now, um, but the, the, the main thing that you can do is connect with Atlantic Black Box. We're just a group of committed individuals and institutions, um, and we, want to partner with you. We want to help um, you in any way that we can. And we uh, will be greatly helped um, in our own work by learning the stories that you can uncover. So now I'm gonna stop. And Kate, uh, you, you may have questions you wanna answer. Sure, well, I saw a question from Jennifer Major in the Q&A um, asking where were these Maine and New England vessels just built in the area? Or were they based ported out of the area? So it's both. Um, and I can briefly uh, essentially answer this. Some of them were uh, built in Maine. Some of them were built and ported in Maine. So they were, uh, had largely Maine crews. They left out of a, you know, a Maine town. Many of them were actually registered out of, particularly during this time period, New York City. Um, but they were essentially embarking for Africa, um, out of this port because there were actually merchants from Cuba that lived in what is now Wall Street, actually. Uh, that So that whole area of New York essentially used to be where all of the slave traders of New York lived, as well as a lot of people engaged in other kinds of trade with the Caribbean, like sugar, those sorts of things. So um, some of these vessels were left directly out of New England ports. So there's a, there's a 
number of them that leave out of Boston um, or Salem, um, but the vast majority uh, during this time period that I've been looking at depart out of New York City. However, during the Brazilian trade, um, they largely departed out of Boston or, um, you know, Portland. So there is a significant amount of crossover as well with, you know, ships being um, built in Maine and Massachusetts and captained by Maine and Massachusetts crews. So, you know, the vast majority of seamen aboard most of these vessels are from New England. Uh, and many of them are actually African American as well. So that's another really interesting dimension, you know, that relates to the broader um, scope of African American sailors um, during this time period. I think I saw another question in the Q&A from Carol Gardner. Have I read that Farwell was a friend of John Brown Rustworm and visited him in Africa before he was killed? I've seen a piece in the main press suggesting as much. I would love to see that piece, Carol, if you could email it to me. I did not know that they knew each other prior to uh, Farwell's death. I did know that Rustworm was aboard the Saratoga, actually, when they went to these uh, different places. And they actually had a palaver, what was supposed to be a palaver with, with the local king, um, but um, while Russ Worm was present, but the, the captain of the Saratoga actually shot and killed the local king and they, so, uh, you know, it was a, it, it's a really interesting connection there, Russ Worm, and of course, this connects to a much broader under, something that Americans do not know about, which is American colonization of Liberia, um, which if you've never really heard about it or understand it, I would, I would definitely suggest um, you look into it because it's, it's quite a, a really deeply embedded history and New England actually plays quite a large role in that um, via the American Colonization Society and the use of New England ships. Uh, there's actually another document in the Maine Historical Society, uh, a broadside from I think 1846, advertising for um, people to donate for the Maine Colonization Society to build a ship specifically to take free black people back to Africa, uh, to take them to Liberia. So um, this is just you know uh, one example, but yes, if you could please send that to me, that'd be awesome. My email is, if you could scroll up to the top of the chat, my email's in the chat. And I think that's most of the questions. Did I, I saw your questions, Mark. I, I don't know um, anything. I, I, need to, I am familiar with the Nightingale um, and Meadow actually is as well. She went down and interviewed the, that is now one of the world headquarters of the Baha'i faith. Uh, so where the Hanscom Yard was is now um, uh, uh, the Baha'i, I don't know the, what the title, the name of the, the center is, Meadow, maybe you could say it, but um, yeah. yes, that the Nightingale um, is a really important vessel uh, in, in terms of the, the sheer size of it and the fact that it was so large and could trans, it was, you know, like a thousand tons, a thousand sixty six tons, and it transported 961 people to Cuba. So just one trip was 961 people. So multiply that times 400 and at least, and that's, that was what the profit was supposed to be if that vessel had not been captured. So um, another really important history. Um, so I, I think that's all of the questions. I think you're right, Kate. I know that, um, a lot of people have been sharing um, some comments on, on research and work that they've already done. And at least one person has asked, how can other scholars that are already working on these issues collaborate with Atlantic Black Box? So is the best thing to do to visit um, the website and become a member? What, what would you advise would be the next step there? Absolutely. Um, so, as I wrote in the chat, um, please don't let the membership fee scare you off. Um, we, we do have, uh, if you're an educator, we ask nothing. Also, if you're a K through 12 student, um, but, uh, but we also can, um, we certainly, we, we want to connect. Um, and so, you know, we have uh, the ability to waive the membership fee if it would stand in the way. 
of um, you joining us. The wonderful thing um, about becoming a member, there, the, there are many things in the works, but one thing that we're doing regularly now that you can immediately benefit from um, as we do is our monthly members research forum. Uh, so next Thursday, we're holding our monthly speaker series. And this month it will be Dr. Um, Harvey Amani Whitfield, um, who is now at the University of Calgary. I put that information in the chat. You can also find it um, on our website. Uh, after that yeah. event, Dr. Whitfield will come back um, on Monday um, to join members of Atlantic Black Box in conversation. And now he will share with us how he did his research, uh, what sources he consulted, what archives were most useful, um, what were some of the obstacles he encountered along the way, and how did he manage to uh, get find workarounds. So um, also, you know, at those member forums are independent researchers, other scholars, people, genealogists, people who are, um, you know, studying their own ancestry. It's fascinating. Everyone comes with really interesting questions and we, our discussions um, really just go in all kinds of fascinating directions. This is how we help each other um, get better at doing this work. So we hope to see you there. Excellent. Well, thank you both so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us this evening. And thank you to our audience for joining us and for your thoughtful questions and comments. If you'd like to learn more about this issue and visit our Begin Again exhibit, whether in person or virtually, visit mainhistory.org. And if you are interested in becoming a member of Atlantic Black Box, becoming a member of the project, or even just learning more about their, their research, their programs, the work that they're doing, uh, AtlanticBlackBox.com. Did I get that website correct, ladies? All right. Well, thank you all. And um, I hope that we'll see everybody back here again for another program soon. Super. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Good night.